This video is going to be about uh, taking the derivative of a composite function. Before we get to the calculus, though, we need to do some pre-cal review. Well, what is a composite function? Well, that's what the first page in the notes is hopefully going to help us remember. So let's jump into it. Um, yeah, you can pause. You can read. I'm not going to read it to you. Pause the video. Read it if you want. Um, but let's go into the example 5.9. If f of x equals x to the 100th and g equals 3x cubed minus 4x squared plus 5, find the composites f of g, g of f, and f of f. Okay, so what this means, right? And another way you may see this, if you don't like the little fog notation, you could write f and then inside the parentheses you have your g of x. Or the second one would be g and then the inside piece is f of x, and then here it would be f of f of x. So this one's the inside, it gets plugged in to that outer framework. So let's go for it. Let's go find, I guess it's not a, b, and c, but whatever. Uh, let's do f of g, which is f g of x. So I'm going to take the g function and then plug it in where the variable is in your f framework. So that f function is taking something and then raising it to the 100th power. So there's your framework. And then you have to take this g function and plug it in. And there you go, there is f of g of x, or your fog. The next one was g of f. So I need to take the f function and plug it in to the g. Now the f, or the g framework, right, the outside piece, uh, that's your framework. And then the, the inside one, that's what you plug in for the variables. So that's 3 something cubed minus 4 something squared plus 5. There's your framework for the g function. And then here I'd have to plug in the f into the spots where there was variables. So that's x to the 100th, x to the 100th. So then you could simplify this one. You have 3x to the 300 minus 4x to the 200 plus 5. And the last one was f of f. So you take the f function and then plug it in to the f function, which is weird, but it's doable. So your f framework is taking something to the 100th power. And then what do I plug in? Well, I plug in the f function. So it's x to, 100th, to the 100th power. So your exponent rules, if you have a power to a power, what you would do is multiply those two. So that ends up giving me x to the 1,000th. Right, so a composite, if it gives you the individual pieces, forming the composite should be doable. And then also the decomposition, breaking down the composite into the individual pieces should also be okay. And that's what the next example is going to be. So here it's, uh, it's really giving us the combined function, the composite, and we're trying to identify what is the outside framework and what's the inside piece that has been plugged in. So kind of think about it like this. I have H, some composite. I have an outside framework, which I'm going to use as F. And then my inside piece is G, right? So your F, that's your outside framework. And then the G, that's the inside piece. What had been plugged in to uh, that F function, right? And again, you could wrote, write this with the fog notation, or you can do F of G of X in the parentheses. Either one's fine. But here, let's look at this first example. I've got y equals the square root of x plus e to the x. The main outside function, or well, the main thing this function is doing is it's taking the square root of something. So here your framework is the square root. And then the inside piece, what you're taking the square root of is your function x plus e to the x. And you could always check, do like what we just did on the previous example, if I were to do f of g, if I were to plug this into the f function, you should end up with the result that we started with. All right, b, I have 1 over x plus 1. So really your framework is the reciprocal function, 1 over stuff, 1 over something, and then your inside piece is x plus 1. 
Example C, you have e to the 3x minus 2. So your outside framework, the main operator that this function is doing is it's taking an exponential of something. So e to the x would be your framework, and then the 3x minus 2 would be your inside piece. And then the last one, we have a 3ln of all this stuff. So we can see our framework is the 3ln part. And then the inside piece is the x squared minus 1, the stuff that was inside of the natural log. So hopefully the composites make sense. Uh, I believe we would have done them at least in pre-cal, maybe even in Algebra 2. Uh, but yeah, hopefully it's okay. You need to be able to recognize specifically the decomposition aspect of it. When I see a function, I need to be able to recognize that it is a composite and what the individual layers of that composite are. Because the chain rule, which is the calculus rule, how do I take the derivative of a composite as opposed to a really easy basic parent function or a power term? Uh, the chain rule isn't super hard calculus-wise. The hardest thing is just remembering to do it. If you can remember to do it, you'll probably do it correctly, but it's sneaky, and so you will likely just forget to do it. Okay, but here's your chain rule. It's written out. Basically, if you want to think about taking the derivative of a composite, here's how you could translate this math into uh, the language. If I have f and g, so you have an outside framework, which is f, then you have that inside piece, which is g. What you need to do is take the derivative of the outside. So if your outside is f, then now we need f prime, so the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. So I'm going to identify both of the layers of the composite, or if it's a three-layer composite, all three, or if it's a seven-layer composite, all seven. I identify each individual piece of the composite. I'm going to take the derivative of each piece, and then chain rule says I'm just going to link them together via multiplication. Okay. So just be greedy. Uh, don't be greedy. Don't say f prime of g prime. That's a really tempting mistake to just do all of the derivatives at once. That's not how it works. You are going to have an f prime and you're going to have a g prime, but you do them one at a time and then you link them together via multiplication. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and skip down to this example 511. Here's that same composite that we had. Remember, we could identify the different layers. The outside framework for me was I was taking something to the 100th power, and then your inside piece is your 3x cubed minus 4x squared plus 5. So I can take the derivative of this composite. It's going to utilize chain rule. But here we go, the derivative on the left, y prime. Let's do it. Here's the outside framework. If I have something to the 100th power, the derivative using the power rule would be 100 something to the 99th power. And then you have to be really careful. On the previous page when we were just doing the pre-cal, when we were purely just identifying the layers of the composite, I would have called this x to the 100th power. Uh, but here we're not just identifying them. We actually have to take the derivative of uh, that layer. And I don't want to put x to the 100th because it's not going to be just an x that's to the 9th. Whatever was originally inside being raised to the 100th, that inside stuff should stay the same. So I'm going to copy what was inside. Whatever was initially raised to the 100th is now inside being raised to the 99th. So 3x cubed, uh, whoops, minus, minus 4x squared plus 5. And this right here is the derivative of your f outside framework, right? Which is just your power rule. The derivative of something to the uh, 100th power is 100, the same something to the 99th. Now, I need to account for this other function, the inside piece, also being a function and also being variable and changing. So I'm going to take this guy's derivative. I'm just going to multiply everything by it. So the derivative of this piece is simply going to be 9x squared minus 8x. And then there you have it. There's your chain rule. Uh, you do the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. Once you've accounted for all the different layers of the composite, you're done. Okay, it's a pretty easy rule if you can recognize when to use it. 
Okay, next couple pages, we have just some practice. If I can keep the camera on the screen, that would be lovely. Okay, the polynomial function, 16x to the fourth minus 8x squared plus 1. It also gives me the factorization of it, which is the 4x squared minus 1, quantity squared. Uh, you can be written as a composite, or you could take the derivative when it's expanded as the polynomial. Uh, we can use the chain rule either way. All right, so let's let's write it as the composite. Let's take the derivative while it's factored, right? Your outside framework is something to the second power, and then the inside piece is your 4x squared at minus 1. Let's take the derivative while it's factored, a composite, and then we'll check it by taking the derivative uh, when it was expanded, just as a polynomial. Okay, so here we go. If my original function is 4x squared minus 1, uh, my outside framework is something squared. I don't like to put the u because you, you might just put a 2u. I just leave it as the something. I leave the parentheses open. There's your outside framework and then your inside piece. I need to make sure I account for both of the two layers. And I'm just going to take the two derivatives and multiply them together. But here we go. The derivative of something squared is 2 times something. And then whatever was inside, was whatever was originally getting squared, that same something is still inside the parentheses. So that's 4x squared minus 1, and then that layer is accounted for. And then as you're copying what that inside piece is, you have to think to yourself, is the derivative of this inside piece 1? If the answer is yes, you don't really have to do chain rule, because multiplying by 1 doesn't change the value of your expression. But if the derivative of this inside piece is something other than 1, you need to do chain rule, which is simply multiply by the derivative of that inside piece. And you could simplify this a little bit. You have the 16x and the 4x squared minus 1. So there you go. If I take the derivative while it's factored, I'm going to get the factored version of the derivative. Uh, and we could expand this. If I took the 16x and I multiplied it out uh, to the 4x squared and to the 1, let's see, you'd have 64x cubed minus uh, a 16x. Let's actually check this by going back to this original function. And then let's take the derivative while it is expanded. Let's see. Here's your first term, 16x to the 4th. If that 4 multiplies to the front and then decreases by 1, the derivative of that first term, look at that. It's going to match. The derivative of negative 8x squared, that 2 multiplies to the front, look at that, it's going to match, and then the 1 goes away. So I can either take the derivative while it's factored, which gives you the factored version of the derivative, and then I could expand it, or I could have just taken the derivative of the expanded. Either way, it should, should give you an equivalent answer. Whether you take the derivative when it's expanded, or if it's factored, you should get the mathematically equivalent answer either way. Okay, next couple, we're just going to practice by doing these derivatives. Again, the trickiest thing is identifying the different layers of the composite, and then the chain rule in practice isn't super hard. Here, the outside framework is cosine of stuff, and then the inside piece is your 2x. Let's do this derivative then, y prime. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. And then I know, hey, the derivative of that 2x, that's just 2, but you don't put a 2 inside of there. Uh, whatever was inside of the cosine is still inside of the trig, so that's a 2x. And so there I've got counted for the inside, or the outside framework. Then I need to do chain rule, the derivative of this piece is 2, which typically I'm just going to write it out on the front. So your derivative of cosine 2x would be negative 2 sine 2x. Okay, part b, I have the square root of stuff. So your outside framework is the square root. And then the 3x squared plus 5x. And then here I go, take the derivative. If I have a square root, using your power rule, let me kind of do this up at the top. If you have a square root, that's just something to the 1 half which when you take the derivative is 1 half something to the negative 1 half, uh, which is 1 over 2 square roots. Right? So that's a pretty common derivative. It's just the power rule. Uh, but if you can just remember that when you have a square root of something, the derivative is 1 over 2 square roots of something, uh, it'll just save you a little bit of time. It's just the power rule, so if you have to do it, it shouldn't take too long. Okay, so here we go. I've got the square root of stuff. The derivative would be 1 over two square roots, and then whatever was inside is still inside. 
So now the outside layer is accounted for. Now I need to do the chain rule. I need to take the derivative of this inside piece and multiply by it. You can either put that chunk on the right, or since it's a fraction, I'm just going to put it on the top. But the derivative of this inside piece would just be a 6x plus 5, and I'm just going to write that in the numerator. Okay, part C, your framework is your ln function, and then the inside piece is 1 minus 3x. We learned this not too long ago. The derivative of your natural log is 1 over stuff. So here you have 1 over, and then whatever was inside of the log goes to the denominator. And then I would need to do chain rule. And that chain rule derivative, again, you can either write times and then write that chain rule derivative on the right. Or uh, if you need to, you can just put it on the top. So I've accounted for the outside framework. The derivative of ln of stuff is 1 over stuff. You can either put the chain rule on the right, or more commonly, you're just going to see it written on the top, just like what I did on the previous example. Now the derivative of this inside piece, the derivative of 1 is 0, but then the derivative of negative 3x, don't forget the negative, would be negative 3. And then we got the last one. Oops, not b, it's d. Ooh, here we go. What we'd want to do is rewrite this. Um, I don't know why I'm putting a parentheses. It's not f of x, it's just y. Uh, so I could rewrite this as 3x squared plus x, and that's just all to the negative first power. So that's like your, your just general reciprocal function. If I had 1 over something, if I had a 1 over x, you could rewrite that as x to the negative first. So when I take the derivative, uh, it would be negative 1x to the negative second. So you'd have a negative 1 over x squared. In general, if I have 1 over something, that derivative is just going to be negative 1 over something squared. Just like how you had the, the, uh, the, the radical, the square root, that's a pretty common derivative. The reciprocal is also a pretty common derivative. It's just the power rule, so if you have to do the power rule every time, it's not the end of the world, but if you can remember it, it'll just be a little bit faster. But I've got 1 over something, so I know that derivative uh, here I got 1 over something, and then the inside piece was your 3x squared plus x. I know the derivative of this is going to be negative 1 over something squared. Whatever was inside is still inside. And then I've accounted for that layer, and then of course I need to do chain rule. And that chain rule I can either put on the right, or I can put it on the top. So that would be a 6x plus 1. Okay, so your, the hardest thing about the chain rule isn't doing it. It's typically pretty easy. The hardest thing about the chain rule is remembering to do it. It's identifying that your function is a composite, and then identifying what the different layers of that composite are. Uh, but then the chain rule says you just have to take the derivative of each layer, and then you just link them all together via multiplication. Derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. Okay, one more page of practice on this notes, then we done. Okay, here we go. Find the derivative of this function by, we'll do it two different ways. We'll expand it, and then we can take the derivative of that polynomial term by term, and then we'll do uh, the, the chain rule. We'll take the derivative while it's factored, and we know it's going to give us equivalent answers. But let's expand it first and do it that way, and then we'll check by doing the chain rule. Right, so let's see, if I were to expand this, polyno uh, your binomial expansion, the 2x starts with all three of the exponents, that starts with nothing, then your next one, uh, you're going to have a 2x squared, and then your 3 to the first power, and then you're going to have the 2x to the first power, 3 squared, and then the last term is going to have just your 3 to the third power. And remember, coefficients, so it would be uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. You could get them either from your formula for your combination, or you can get them uh, from Pascal. And it's 1, 3, 3, 1 is that uh, second row, or the third row, the row with the 3 in the second number. Um, and then let's, let's keep working on it. So that's going to be 8x cubed. Plus, let's see, that's 9. 9 times 4 would be 36. 
and then that's going to be a 27 times 2, so that's a 54. And then 3 to the third power is just 27. So I haven't done any calculus. I've still got the original function. I've just expanded it. So I now I have the polynomial. And the derivative of the polynomial should be very easy, right? It's just the power rule. So here I've got 24x squared plus 72x plus 54. Okay, so expanding it took some algebra initiative, some algebra work on our part, but that algebra made the calculus easier. Uh, but you didn't need to do that, right? If you can just do chain rule, you can take the derivative while it's factored. Here I've got something to the third power, and then the inside piece is 2x plus 3. I know how to take the derivative of something to the third power. It's just 3 something squared. And then whatever was inside is still inside. So this is a 2x plus 3. Then that outside layer is now done. And then I just account for the inside piece by multiplying by its derivative. So I can get that this derivative is 6, 2x plus 3 squared, right? So there's the factored version of the derivative. Let's multiply it out. So I'd have 6. Let's see, you have a 4x squared plus uh, 3 times 2 is 6. Double it, so that's 12x plus 9. Distribute the 6, 24x squared plus 6 times 12 would be 72. 6 times 9 is 54. And look at this. That matches just like we knew it would. So if you really wanted to, sometimes you can avoid the chain rule. I don't really think that's necessary because taking the derivative, I think it's just easier, right? Take the derivative while it's factored, then you get the factored version of the derivative. Chain rule is not super scary. If you want to do the algebra, sometimes you may be able to multiply it out. And then once you have it multiplied out, you could take the derivative. And then you'll end up with an equivalent expression. But I don't think chain rule is something that you guys have to super stress about. So there you go. You can do it either way. Okay, last four. Again, we're just going to find, uh, for each function, we're just going to find the derivative. Now, be careful with this one, right? This, I would rewrite it as sine of x squared, right? Since that trig function is getting squared, uh, the outside framework is actually, I have something getting squared, and then the sine of x is the inside piece. Okay, so be careful. Anytime you see that squared or that exponent on the trig, I always rewrite it like this. Um, because that's very different. Here you have sine of x squared. So this framework is sine of something, and then the inside piece is x squared. Uh, for this one, your framework is e to the something, and then your sine is the inside piece. And then here your framework is the cube root, so you have something to the one-third power, and then that inside something uh, actually, you've got a squared and it's a cube root, so that's a two-thirds power. And then that inside something is a 7 minus 5x. Okay, so once you identify it, that it is a composite and you know what the individual layers are, chain rule is pretty easy. Just take the derivative of each piece and then multiply them all together. Let's go to this first one, sine squared. The derivative is not cosine squared. I know it's tempting. Don't do it, though. Here I go. The outside function is something squared. So I know that guy's derivative would start off by having a 2 times something. And then whatever was originally getting squared is now inside these brackets. And then that layer's good. And then we got to take the derivative of that inside piece, which is cosine. So look at that. The derivative of sine squared is not cosine squared. It's 2 sine cosine, which hopefully you remember is actually a trig identity. It's a double angle. It's your sine of 2x. That's a nice question that they like to put on IB exams. It's like, prove that the derivative of sine squared is sine of 2x. And you're like, what? The derivative of sine is cosine. What does it talk about? Well, if you use chain rule, you should be able to figure out what they're talking about. Okay, part B. Sine of x squared. So your outside framework is sine of x. And I know the derivative of sine is cosine. So I have cosine of stuff. And then whatever was inside of the sine is still inside of the cosine. And then chain rule says multiply by the derivative of the inside. And typically, if you have those extra pieces, you would usually write them in front of the trig. So 2x 
cosine x squared. The derivative of sine is cosine, the argument stays the same, and then that 2x kicks, uh, kicks out to the front because of the chain rule. That layer is good, and then that layer was gone. Okay, next one, we have e to the something. I know the derivative of e to the something is e to the something. We did that uh, not too long ago, the same day we did the trig. Uh, so whatever was the exponential, you have that exact same exponential in the derivative. How wonderful. But then you need to account for what that inside something was by multiplying by its derivative. So here you could write it as cosine x times e to the sine of x. Typically, you would write that extra stuff in front of the exponential. And then the last one. Here I've got uh, this something, right? That's something to the 2 thirds power. Uh, I've got a cube root. That's the 3 on the bottom. Then it's all squared. That's the 2 on the top. And I know the derivative of something to the 2 thirds power would be 2 thirds something to the negative 1 third. And then whatever was inside is still going to be inside. So I have 7 minus 5x. That's good. Now I have to account for that inside piece, the derivative of 7 minus 5x. It's just negative 5. And then if you wanted to, you could rewrite it. You've got a negative 5 and a 2 on the top, so negative 10 over. you got a 3, and then you have this cube root on the bottom. I'm not going to put the cube root because I think those radicals are just hideous. Uh, I'm just going to leave it as a 1 -third power. Okay, but there you have it, chain rule. It's tricky, not because it's hard, but because it's uh, hard to recognize, right? If you can remember to do it, you will probably do it correctly, but almost all of you, uh, actually, all of you will miss points this year because of the chain rule, um, so just try to be on your toes.